that. I was hoping to get a fun little jingle for everybody to listen to while we joined, but um, maybe having some technical difficulties on the technology side. But um, that said, I think we'll get started. Good morning, everybody. We've got a an awesome panel here. Before we get started, um, thanks for joining. Um, this will be about two hours long, so it should be jam-packed full of information. In the meantime, I want to get a poll started. So if folks that are here want to go in and answer the poll, that'll pop up briefly, and we'll give you all about a minute to, to put that in there. We're seeing some responses here come in, start to filter in. There we go. Great, we're getting up to about a little over half folks have voted while you finish up your votes. If you don't know me, I'm David Valancourt, CEO of the GMP Collective. We've got a fantastic panel lined up for you today, including, of course, myself. But um, I'll get some faces shown here once we get the poll wrapped up in about five seconds. So last call, get your votes in. Awesome. So looks like we've got a good breakdown. Um, just a little over half are familiar with the new Colorado recall and capital regulations for the 40 plus percent that aren't, you came to the right place. You're gonna learn all about it and even more importantly, how to make it work for your business and to uh, be prepared for compliance. <laughs> I like to see that we've got a, a good spread. We've got quite a bit of consultants on today. Um, love to chat with you guys anytime. Um, you know, we're all here to help the industry together. So the more we can educate, be on the same page and um, you know, share these best practices with the manufacturers, cultivators and dispensaries, et cetera, that are here, the better. Um, and it looks like we've got a, a good amount of uh, folks across the spectrum from, uh, you know, a senior level to compliance and leadership. And, you know, really at the end of the day, these practices are are for you guys. They're to allow the front you know, line workers to do their job, to have a process to improve and correct mistakes and prevent them from happening again, because we're all humans. And anytime there's a human involved, there's going to be a risk for error. So um, this is a great tool that prevents you from having to have a recall. But in the event that you have to have a recall, you've also got the tools. <clears throat> um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel, and uh, so we've got myself here, CEO of GMP Collective, alongside uh, Miss Kathleen May, who's the president of Triscally Quality Solutions. You'll be hearing from her. She'll be speaking all about, uh, she's kind of the, dubbed her the Kappa Queen in the ASTM Standards International world. Um, she's eat, slept, and breath, breathed Kappa for, for decades in the medical uh, device life science industry. We've got Greg Jones, our CEO, or COO, sorry, and principal consultant here at GMP Collective. Him and I work together on, you know, with many clients across the landscape. We work on standards policy setting in the state of Colorado and nationally. Um, so he's going to tie some dots together there. And um, last but certainly not least, we've got uh, Mr. Kevin Gallagher, who is the Director of Regulatory Affairs over at Apothecary Extracts, which is a fairly sizable um, extract company here in Colorado with operations outside of Colorado as well. He's going to be speaking about how he used our pilot um, program to get them, their company compliant. Um, off the bat. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, this is a I'm, this is not a presentation to speak to you per se. This is something for as much interaction. This is for you guys. So if you have questions as we go through, type them in the Q&A box. We've got a fantastic moderator behind the scenes that will be filtering them up to us. We'll pause and address them as it aligns and you know comes up to uh, as it aligns with where we're speaking about. Uh, we'll also have a couple of Q&A breaks. So if you are holding off, there'll be clear opportunities to ask Q&A. And um, if you wanna you know, 
speak up and have everybody hear your voice as well. Just raise your hand through the chat, um, through the participant role, and uh, we'll, we'll call on you, unmute you to um, allow you to ask it out loud and engage in a discussion. <laughs> so just to give you a setup for how you're going to get through two hours, um, we're going to make this fun. This is not, you know, compliance can be dry. We're going to be a little more excitement, excited than that. We've got a, an outline here and an agenda. So we'll go over, you know, the overview of why Kappa. Um, I will start off with that. Kevin at Apothecary will uh, speak about the case study and how they implemented ICA the ICAPA program, which includes CAPA in a recall system, which is an integrated system to help their business. Um, Kathleen will then pick up from there. She will spend about a half an hour to 40 minutes with a couple of breaks and Q&A opportunities to you know, get you guys to understanding what is a CAPA and how does that work? What are some of the meat and potatoes behind this acronym. Uh, Kevin will then come back and join us to speak about the Colorado regulations, which back to the, you know, almost 40% that either we're not aware or familiar with or not sure if they were familiar with. Um, he's going to kind of give you some uh, insight into exactly what, what we're talking about here, back to the um, CRS, Colorado Revised Statutes. Um, Greg will, will speak for a bit about kind of that collaborative approach of standardization and how it's, you know, a little bit bigger than just cap it and recall. And this is an integrated quality system best practice that allows you to, you know, scale as a business and, you know, maintain compliance from, from the get-go and improve your operations. And I'll, I'll give a little bit more of an application example and we'll kind of tie that up to a final Q&A. So thanks everybody again for joining. Really excited to have you here. Get yourself, uh, you know, a cup of, you know, refill your coffee if you haven't already, have a cup of water, um, have the speakers up loud with anybody else that's listening and joining you. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors. We've got, uh, we had four fantastic sponsors. Um, I Love Compliance, head by Tim Gunther. Uh, they have a, fan, they use a fantastic document management system that makes it really easy to scale and ensure everybody's trained and accountable. Um, Supply Chain OpEx Consulting is a, um, a, a a supply chain company that's geared for small and mid-sized companies taking you know 40 plus years of fortune 500 life sciences and medical device experience and applying that to the industry here in cannabis um, bsi global is uh stands for the british standards institute super excited to have them as uh, supporting sponsors uh founded around the turn of the century the turn of the 1900s the 20th century not the 21st century they have developed uh, many standards that are globally recognized now through iso and other avenues so it's great to have the british standards institute here as a sponsor and then um a keen consulting is a is a fantastic tax and accounting firm that is a, an offshoot of a you know 40 year old <clears throat> tax and auditing firm in the you know non-cannabis world so uh, they work with things like 280e 971c etc to help uh, manage your tax liability because anybody that has to deal with the numbers and paying uncle sam knows that 280e is a pain in the butt for us and whether the more act helps change that or not is not here for us to speculate or even advise on but a keen will help you guys so thank you to all of our sponsors um, before we really get started, one more poll. And give everybody, uh, so what does CAPA stand for? Um, go ahead and answer that question. I'll give you about a minute or so. Awesome, thanks everybody. Wrap this up in about a couple seconds. So 
what does Kappa stand for? It's funny. So this is uh, for folks. This is our second event we've run. This is our second webinar. We did this last month. I am excited to see that the numbers have changed a little bit. I will say that the argument can be made. Um, number one, 53% answered corrective action and preventative action. That's technically not incorrect, but the more common lexicon is corrective action, preventive action. So, um, you know, there is some, some lexicon and terminology there. Um, cry and pray a lot is definitely something that it can feel like. And um, let's, let's just say that I think Kathleen will come in and help show you how you don't have to cry and pray a lot during a CAPA and how it can actually be effective. So let's kind of set the scene, right? Um, why are CAPAs, why are recalls a thing? Well, for starters, mistakes happen. Um, and let's just look at the data here. This is from 2018. I use this because it's actually a nice visual layout, but the 2019 results are almost identical. Um, in Colorado, you have to final test almost every product. There is a reduced testing regimen through process validation, but for, for what it's worth, final testing packages that passed, you're looking at a 12% failure rate uh, for microbial and contaminants as well um, on flour and shaker trim, as well as um, you know just under 12% for infused edibles. The fact that that's happening, it should be a major red flag to any business owner. Um, that's a pain point, right? And you've spent how many months propagating vegging, flowering your product, drying your product, just to find out that your process resulted in a failure of microbial contaminants. Um, best practices should be in place so that that does never happen. That's the exception, not the rule. And a Kappa, again, is a system that will put in, that put it, when put in place, will allow you to go back and prevent that from happening so that this number actually increases. Um, and the fact that since it's been, you know, since Colorado's had a market for almost a decade now, this number has not improved. It is basically flatline suggests that there is a lack of uh, improvement uh, best practices in place and it's, it's really hurting uh, yourselves. So um, this is a tool to help you guys improve, become more effective and sustainable so that you don't have to have a recall. Um, one quick uh, question I see popped up, I'll, I'll address. Uh, if the presentation will be made available after the webinar, the answer is yes. Both the PowerPoint will be shared and uh, we'll have this up on uh, a YouTube link for all to access later. So if you're not able to make the whole thing, which hopefully you can, um, or you wanna share it with your team later or other folks, it will be available for watching. So again, failure rate, we're looking at greater than 10% here. Um, and really, you know, I'd like to ask the question, kind of a rhetorical question, but what do you feel is an acceptable failure rate? Um, I'd say 10% is a little bit too high for a profitable business. And, um, you know, looking at just say 2.5%, if we were to throw a number out there, that's a reduction in say 75%, right? Um, so you can reduce your product loss by up to 75, 80%, or at least your cost of rework significantly. And again, that's the benefit of a Kappa, having a Kappa program in place. So, you know, I like to just food for thought for folks, you know, how much is poor quality costing your organization? And I think, you know, the answer is probably more than you'd like, more than you're comfortable with. So kind of alluded to, but let's just walk through some of the benefits of a Kappa. When the MED, CDPH, and your, you know, the FDA someday shows up, knocks on your door, you're ready. Your audit readiness is there because the first place that an FDA person is going to look nine times out of 10, probably 95 times out of 100, if not higher, is your audit readiness and your Kappa program. They're going to look at your Kappa because that is the information that you have that shows how you identify issues, mistakes, deviations, et cetera, and how you put implement programs and processes in place to prevent them from happening again. Um, so if you're a cultivator and, or, and or a manufacturer, it's going to benefit you significantly because every time you have something happen, whether it's related to training, uh, you know, 
poor specifications, you know, an equipment breakdown. This is the tool that's going to allow you to make sure that that's not a common theme. Just because oven one and oven five broke down and now oven three broke down, maybe there's a commonality there and having a CAPA program in place allows you to actually look at that holistically and not be in the firefighting mode that I think all of us in a startup can struggle to uh, get out of. And, you know, the beauty is we're a maturing industry and this is going to help you elevate yourself um, beyond just being compliant with the MED rules, which again, Colorado provides statute as of January 1st, if you're a cannabis a business in the state of Colorado and you don't have a CAPA program, you're non-compliant and there's going to be, you know, financial and, you know, other repercussions, fines, et cetera, related to that. So make sure that your quality and compliance unit, um, you know, looking at all those uh, sticky notes that one should never have, looking at all that paperwork that, you know, drowns a, um, a busy quality and compliance unit, it, it's going to help them. It's going to help them understand where the issues are and how to improve and how to be confident when an audit happens that you're compliant. Um, so, you know, there's significant benefits here and it's really a tool to help you guys because the reality is it's a full-time job making sure you're following the rules um, and you're going to have mistakes and you're going to have non-conformances, but it's not the fact that you have the non-conformances per se, it's how do you prevent them and put systems in place to detect them and ensure that it doesn't ultimately affect product quality, which comes back to the product, final product testing. You want to get ahead of the curve and know that your product's going to pass before you send it. As senior leadership, if you're senior leadership, you know, you know, mistakes are very expensive. Um, and once you, this, this tool allows you to start discovering and uncovering a lot of the mistakes or issues that happen, deviations out of specifications, um, you want to be eager to fix them. You want to fix them the first time, not the 17th time. Um, so this allows you a tool to be able to monitor and see how things are effective and how that's increasing your bottom and top line um, and then enjoy the savings. And you know, ultimately why I, I personally exist in this cannabis space is because it's about the consumer. This is not about us, you know, there's profits, there's, there's compliance, there's all these issues, but really it's about safe product for the consumer. And this is a tool to give confidence to the regulators and back to the consumer that they know that when mistakes happen, you're on top of it. You have a system in place to address mistakes before it makes it to the consumer so that a recall is the absolute last resort last thing that happens and in the case of a recall the consumer knows that they're going to be able to find out about it that you're going to have traceability in place to be able to capture and get that information back and know which products were and were not affected so the consumer can again have confidence in your brand moving forward <clears throat> the one way i look to like to put at look at it is you know it's about turning the negative into a positive so you know ensuring safety and consistency of your product i mean that's that's how you scale, right? That's how you ensure that when you're in Florida, Colorado, California, Oklahoma, whatever state, that you're getting the same product when you go to McDonald's, the quality is consistent and predictable and they have control on that so that the burger is the same size, the flavor is the same. You want the same thing with your products, whether it's in one, one facility and multiple facilities across multiple jurisdictions or otherwise. Um, you want to reduce your risk. I mean, ultimately, it's all about risk and taking calculated risks because we can't reduce everything to zero. Um, there's always going to be some sort of risk involved and it's about identifying them, detecting them and reducing them. And that ties back to your customer experience, right? The final final product this is for your customers and you want have to have as positive of a customer experience as possible, whether it's the patient or consumer in the retail store or the retailers that are buying your products as a manufacturer or cultivator. And, you know, the cool thing is you can turn your complaints, you need that feedback, you turn that into an opportunity for customer engagement. So um, building brand loyalty, building customer retention is, is an opportunity that using the Kappa system, again, allows you to not just be compliant, but to really engage and build your brand. Uh, because the reality is that when, um, when complaints are resolved satisfactory, satisfactorily, you know, re repurchase jumps by over 50%. And that's, you know, just standard across kind of the, the CPD consumer packaged goods and otherwise industries. So, you know, really, if you were to boil it down, we all know, and I, we all get caught up in the firefighting because that's, that's the world we, we live in as a business many days, but an ounce of prevention is really worth a pound of cure.
and this is, this is all about that preventive section, the more you can do that, the better you can sleep at night, the more effective your business can be and you can get ahead of the curve. So with that said, I want to turn that this over to Kevin. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Good morning. Um, and I'll let you kind of go through the case study here from your experience at Apothecary Extracts. Thanks, David. Hey, everybody. Kevin Gallagher here. You're, I think you're muted or your microphone. Can you hear me now? Uh, about now. Double check your microphone, Kevin, when you click the little arrow down there. Um, maybe you have to select a different microphone. Oh, never mind. Go ahead. Everybody oh, else can uh, hear you. It's me. Excellent. Great. Uh, so, hey, everybody. Kevin Gallagher, uh, Director of Compliance and Regulatory Affairs at Apothecary Extracts and Apothecary Farms and Executive Director of the Colorado Cannabis Manufacturers Association. So, we had the pleasure to work very closely with the GMP Collective um, uh, in their iCappa program in terms of uh, how to integrate uh, CAPA and recall procedures in our own operations. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go down here and just talk about our experience a, a little bit and um, really kind of the benefits that, that we received from here. So. Um, when we're looking at implementing a uh, CAPA program or, or recall program or, or really any sort of quality management system in general, um, we need to remember that it all starts at the top. Um, senior management really needs to buy into the need for these things. Um, obviously, as we know, senior management is the cornerstone of company culture, um, right? And all that trickles down to management and then other employees. Um, I myself was very fortunate that apothecary leadership uh, really bought into the need uh, of these things and um, really gave me the bandwidth that I needed um, to really implement uh, these procedures accordingly. Um, and I think when we are, um, when we are designated either uh, employees or, or groups to implement these uh, quality management systems, uh, we need to make sure we're being very realistic, right? We, we can't be uh, given this project to an employee who's balancing about 50 other different things. Um, you know, I tell people all the time that when you're looking at capital and recall in particular, um, these can't be implemented in a day or, or even a week for that matter, right? Um, it really takes uh, thoughtful implementation um, that you have to, uh, that you can't do alone. You have to integrate um, people in the trenches in this in these things and, and, and make sure this stuff actually works. So um, don't take this stuff lightly. Um, you know, as David pointed out, not only is this a requirement, but this is actually a legitimate business tool that can protect your business, uh, protect your consumers, uh, mitigate liability. Um, I mean, really, this stuff is everything. So very important. So uh, in terms of our onboarding process, uh, we uh, utilize the help of both uh, the GMP Collective and uh, Power DMS. So I know uh, David was talking about uh, I Love Compliance and their useful document management system. Uh, that was again uh, Power DMS. And uh, I'll explain Power DMS uh, a little bit more as I go down here. But um, it really made the onboarding process uh, very seamless and, and as easy as possible. So uh, what's great about the Collective is collective is that they really had an arsenal of documents um, and procedures related to CAPA, recall, and other quality management systems. And we uh, had our choice of what documents uh, we wanted. Um, and so, of course, in this case, we focused primarily on CAPA and recall and more quality forward documents. Um, so specifically, some of those documents included, um, and I'm just going to kind of name off the titles here, Senior Management Commitment to Continuous Improvement, uh, Corrective Action Preventative Action Reports, Product Recall Form, uh, Mock Recall Product Accountability Form, uh, Recall Policy Evaluation Checklist, Quality Assurance, Quality Control Operations, Vendor Qualifications Procedure, very important, uh, CAPA Procedure, Recall Procedure, um, Complaint Investigation Procedure, and uh, Document Control as well. And I'll tell you, they have much more documents than, than, uh, than those. And uh, really these documents ultimately gave us the 
uh, foundation that we needed to implement these practices. Um, and also, uh, you know, what was great is it really gave us also um, the confidence to, to implement this stuff as well. So um, all we had to do was um, connect each document to our own operations, right? These documents are just templates with a lot of useful information. So again, we just had to plug in our unique operations to it, maybe make it a little bit more applicable to maybe little things that we do. And then boom, we basically had a, a, a working procedure. Um, and so uh, in terms of kind of going down this experience too, um, you know, after we received these documents, we had a preliminary Zoom call with the collective. Uh, we reviewed the documents uh, that we obtained in more detail, uh, why ultimately they were needed, um, and the best practices in terms of how to implement those uh, various documents and procedures. Um, we all, also gave us an opportunity to explain our operations in more detail, along with our own perceived uh, bottlenecks, right? Every company has operational bottlenecks when it comes to compliance and, and definitely quality assurance. So um, the call itself was extremely eye-opening and really allowed management um, to really think a little bit more critically in terms of using a more GMP-related mindset. Now, uh, uh, about a month later, a few weeks later or so, um, we did conduct our first mock recall. And so we were able to have a uh, follow-up phone call with the collective on that. And um, they're able to give us a lot of different pointers, um, additional recommendations, best practices, et cetera, on, on how we kind of can improve our uh, recall process. And uh, we we're also able to describe our, our own pain points as a company too. Um, you know, when you're doing a CAPA, uh, one of the things that you have to do is, is really find the root cause of, of the issue that occurred. And there might be some situations out there where you realize that you can't find necessarily the root cause for a concern. So for us in particular, um, you know, maybe something like environmental monitoring, uh, whether it's within back ovens or, or other pieces of technology, right? Uh, super important. Um, and then of course, comprehensive lot tracking, obviously metric tracks our cannabis inputs, but you know, being able to track other inputs um, is definitely gonna be really important as well, not just uh, cartridge hardware, but of course, um, you know, containers that are used, any, any sort of entity that's directly touching any product. Um, and of course, right now at Apothecary, we're in the middle of implementing a, an ERP system for that. So we're super excited to, to finally get that going. Um, another thing here is flexibility. The, co the, collective, the collective itself really tailored the conversation and recommendations to our needs um, and business operations, right, which made this whole thing very, very tangible. Now, when we look at Power DMS, um, again, it's a very, very comprehensive document management system. Uh, what's great about this is that, uh, you know, it's not some person in their basement that just made this program up just for the cannabis industry. Uh, they're not reinventing the wheel here. Uh, this program has been around for uh, just about two decades now. Um, and the folks at I Love Compliance uh, really held our hand in this process. Um, they were able to uh, set up these various documents in the system. Um, you know, prior to uploading those documents, they were able to uh, give us some really good comprehensive training um, on how to use this system. And what's great is, right, not just managing documents, but actually assigning workflow for different documents. Um, this can be used as a training tool. You can upload training videos. You can create um, assessments on this stuff, um, especially as a, a, a multi-location uh, entity in an MSO, right? This was super critical for us uh, to be able to uh, really implement consistent operations uh, company-wide. And I know that that is a struggle for, for most companies, as David mentioned before, right? When you look at McDonald's, right? You have consistent operations around the country and probably around the world, right? Um, and that shouldn't be any different for cannabis businesses. So uh, being able to, uh, you know, align with a solid entity like Power DMS and I Love Compliance and the collective um, really has made our lives a lot easier. Um, in terms of, again, the biggest takeaways here um, is, the mindset, it starts at the top. Um, the onboarding uh, process itself was very quick. Um, the GMP Collective has incredible SOPs and documents at their disposal um, and allows you the opportunity to pick the stuff that's right for your company. 
Um, again, Power DMS is extremely critical for operational consistency and document management, especially for MSOs. And then um, the ICAPA can and should be utilized company-wide, no matter where those operations are located. And then again, um, when you're developing and um, implementing your CAPA and recall, recall program, it should not be taken lightly. Again, um, this is ultimately uh, used for your business to protect yourselves and, and protect your consumers and, and really drive quality throughout the supply chain. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, yeah, I could not, uh, you know, as you said, <clears throat> there's a lot of value here and, you know, to look at the continuous improvement perspective and management buy-in, you know, sitting around the table, seeing profits stagnate or decline, seeing sales not go super well, um, you know, we're seeing struggles and, you know, what if we don't change it all and something just magical happens? Well, it's just not that simple. And, this is a tool to really help you write the ship and make data, you know, smart informed decisions. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, before we hand it over to Kathleen, um, wanna take a, a quick poll break. And I'm curious to see, you know, does your organization have a CAPA program? Um, let's start there. And um, again, if the answer is no, you're, you came in the right place. And if the answer is yes, then uh, you know we're excited to see uh, what you learn out of it because you know CAP is not, it's a tool. There's tools within the tools and um, it can always be improved upon back to the whole continuous improvement. So we're excited for you to take something away and perhaps add a new tool to your, your CAPA process. We'll give folks another about 15 seconds. Um, so if you haven't voted yet, get your votes in folks. So we've got about 65% responded. So get back from that coffee break. You get about five seconds, four, three, two, one. And uh, let's see here, what do we have? So it's fairly well split. Um, some folks aren't sure. That's great. Um, you know, when you get off the call, go ask your compliance person, go ask your team, do we have a CAPA process? And um, if not, why are we not using it? <laughs> Otherwise, uh, yeah, we're about split 50-50. So um, yeah, Kathleen, I will um, hand this over to you and you'll share with the industry and the audience what the heck is a CAPA? Hello. I hear you. Hello. I know. I just lost my screen, though. That's not oh, good. No. Oh, no. Oh, wait. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, I got nervous. <laughs> well, we can see you. All bright eyed. Go good. for it, Kathleen. <laughs> okay. So um, let's get into the nitty gritty of, of what CAPA is. So, um, as stated previously, CAPA stands for Corrective Action Preventive Action. And CAPA focuses on identifying, investigating, and correcting quality issues and other undesirable um, events in your operation. A CAPA program analyzes data and data trends um, to really determine if an, if an issue is recurring, uh, possibly systemic in nature, or could potentially have an impact to consumer health and safety. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so what's the purpose of CAPA? CAPA, uh, the purpose of CAPA is to investigate the root cause of any product or process or other quality issue. Uh, a CAPA program identifies and implements appropriate corrective actions or preventive actions um, to prevent recurrence of an existing quality issue or the occurrence of a potential um, problem in your operation. Your CAPA program should monitor the effect effectiveness of implemented actions um, there's no point in uh, implementing actions if they're actually not going to work. And your CAPA program really needs to, um, you know, have a procedure in place that requires the collection and the analysis of data 
um, doing this allows your operation to act in a more proactive uh, state rather than uh, reactive. You know, that constant firefighting gets old. Um, of course, you can't, you can't prevent every situation that happens in your operation, but the goal with your CAPA program is to try to be as proactive as, as possible. And ultimately, um, your CAPA program is there to ensure problems are detected and, and resolved. An auditor's gauge of the quality and compliance of an operation is how well they um, resolve their quality issues. So the CAPA, within your CAPA process, quality issues are defined, investigated, and ultimately corrected. CAPA activities occur in every process involved in your operation and in the product life cycle. That includes you know, manufacturing deviations, laboratory audit specification investigations, an audit response is the type of CAPA, a process improvement is a type of CAPA, hence the acronym Corrective Action Preventive Action. Not all CAPAs have to be corrective action in nature. Uh, the preventive action piece of CAPA allows you to do process improvements. Customer complaints are a type of CAPA and yeah, product recall, which is obviously a topic of today's conversation. And, it, and an ineffective CAPA ultimately is a CAPA. So when you have a, a CAPA that fails in effectiveness uh, criteria, that CAPA has to go back into the investigation phase because clearly the correct uh, root cause wasn't identified and ultimately um, the correct uh, actions were not taken. So there's a number of reasons why CAPA programs um, may be ineffective. There's really no perfect system. Everybody does it a little bit different. But one particular issue with ineffective CAPA programs is that organizations tend to put all of their issues into their CAPA process or they put no issues into their CAPA process. So you have to find that happy medium and you have to have procedures in place that define what ultimately requires a CAPA. Um, but oftentimes single events, they don't require an extensive root cause investigation. You can handle those through an incident report. You know, obviously the, the incident has to be documented, but it doesn't necessarily require a full root cause investigation. So here's an opportunity for some Q&A. Um, so what situations have you encountered that you'd like us to discuss and, and whether, you know, we can help you figure out if that situation should should be put into your CAPA program or not. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. If folks want to, uh, we've got a couple of examples, but um, as Keith just put there, you can type your answers in the Q&A box or raise your hand if uh, is a perfect opportunity. If you've got a scenario uh, or you want to make it a little vague, maybe it wasn't yours, but somebody you know, and figure out how you, we could have handled that through CAPA, um, we're here to listen and use your example. All right, so we have a, f a few examples here. We'll, we'll cover uh, um, maybe a couple of them. So we have one, you are process validated and fall, or fail, sorry, in ongoing tests for residual salts. So the question is, would this be a CAPA? Um, yes, this would be a CAPA, because you have a validated process that you clearly have deviated from because you have a failure for a residual solvent. So this would definitely um, require a CAPA and would fall under um, your out of specification, uh, out of specification um, procedure for, for this particular situation. So another example here, would the following example require a CAPA investigation? A manufacturer receives a product complaint for a consumer disliking the taste of a cannabis tincture. So should that fall into your CAPA program or not? So this incident definitely should be documented. Um, however, this is, you know, this is the um, opinion of, of the consumer and wouldn't necessarily um, need a root cause investigation because it's not 
there's really no impact to the product quality or product safety. Now, if there were continued complaints for this particular issue, then it would be a good business decision to maybe look at a preventive action or a process improvement with regards to um, the taste of the cannabis tincture. Awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. Hey, it looks like we've got uh, a, a question um, or an example situation here. Um, if a hair is found by a patient in their cannabis flower container and a complaint is made, um, could you maybe speak to that? Sure. Um, so this definitely, I mean, this this comes in and, and I haven't gotten into this yet with, with my presentation, but David um, touched on this. You know, you get into part of the, you know, the initial um, process of, of doing a CAPA is doing an initial risk assessment. So that risk assessment determines severity, you know, or, or you know, potential impact to consumer health and safety. In this situation, um, you know, a hair definitely would be cause of concern. Um, you know, hair can carry a lot of contaminants on it. So in this case, I would definitely um, put this into a CAPA program because maybe additional testing would, would have to be done on that product just to make sure that it's not contaminated anyway. Because product testing is not, you're not testing your whole lot. It's only, you know, it's, it's you're, you're taking samples of that lot and testing it. So it, it's a good indicator that your product lot is, is safe, but you know, it's, it's not 100% testing. So there might still be issues within that lot. We ready to move on? Or? Yeah, go for it. Okay. And then there is one question, but it may be, I don't know if you want to answer that now or um, in a little bit. Uh, the question is, what is the, what are the main differences between Kappa and uh, TPS or Kaizen thinking? Well, um, part of your Kappa process, and again, we'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about uh, root cause analysis and using root, root uh, uh, the tools. Um, so Kaizen is actually a, a brainstorming event that you can use as part of your CAPA process to start identifying potential root causes. So I would say uh, these are, are, can be incorporated into your CAPA pro, uh, program as a means to flush out and start figuring out what your potential root causes are and allow you to figure out, you know, which ones can be eliminated or which ones, you know, kind of stay on the list of, of, of potential um, issues or potential contributing factors. Does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. If, uh, if um, anybody wants clarification on that, feel free to um, you know, ask a clarifying question. Otherwise, we'll go, yeah, keep moving forward, Kathleen, thanks. Sure. All right, so every CAPA process involves five basic steps. The first is you need to define the issue the second is you would do an initial risk assessment. And again, I, I said this previously is that initial risk assessment is to just determine the scope and the boundaries of the investigation. You should be assessing risk throughout the entire process, but that initial risk assessment really helps define the scope. The third is to investigate the root cause of the issue or the cause of the issue. And this is really the, the meat and potatoes of the whole process. And this is where you would use your root cause analysis tools. There's a multitude out there. Again, I would encourage that your CAPA program, your CAPA process, include the requirement to use our root cause analysis tools. There's some easy ones, five whys, is, is not, um, brainstorming like I just um, mentioned. Um, so next is to, you need to correct the issue. And finally, you need to monitor the effectiveness of those corrective actions or preventive actions that you put into place. So there's three actions that you would take in response to, um, or that you would implement as far as the CAPA process goes. The first would be a correction. A correction is an immediate action to eliminate a detected issue. Corrections are typically one-time fixes and are oftentimes called remedial or containment actions. Putting product on hold would be an example of a correction. Next is a corrective action which is the action to eliminate the cause of a detected issue or undesirable condition. And the intent of a corrective action is to eliminate the recurrence of that issue. And finally, a preventive action is the action taken to eliminate the cause of a potential problem. So the intent of a preventive action is to prevent occurrence of a potential problem. 
And this slide is just a pictorial of, of what I just explained. So let's dig a little deeper into the actual um, CAPA process flow. So that first step, like I said, is to define the, the problem. And here's where you're going to um, come up with a very solid problem description or a problem statement that outlines the who, what, when, where, and the scope or the magnitude of the issue. Next would be that initial risk assessment. Um, and again, this is just to, to, to put a boundary around um, what the issue is. And this is where you would identify if maybe if there's product out in the field that is potentially impacted by the issue. Next is the investigation. And again, this is, this is where the magic happens. This is where you're going to use your root cause analysis tools to help drill down to the root cause of the issue. Next is identifying appropriate corrections, corrective actions, or preventive actions. Next step is to verify and validate. So you wanna make sure that whatever corrective actions that you've identified, that they're actually going to work and that they're not going to ne negatively impact maybe some other, um, you know, other operation that you have or other process that you have in your operation or, or potentially could negatively affect the product. Next, of course, then is to implement those actions or yeah, implement those corrective actions. And finally is the monitoring phase, which is um, the effectiveness uh, part of the CAPA process. And your effectiveness phase needs to have defined effectiveness criteria that you know that you can measure your effectivity against. So there's three uh, CAPA classifications: um, minor, major, and critical. Some operations may use low, medium, high. It doesn't really matter. So minor issues typically don't affect any quality attribute or critical process parameter. You won't do a root cause investigation because they're resolved by implementing immediate corrections. Uh, documentation error would be an ex example of a minor issue. You can do a simple good documentation practice correction. But of course, with anything, um, you need to have objective evidence to support that decision and that justification. Major issues may affect a quality attribute or critical process parameter. Uh, there is a, a likelihood of impact to consumers. Major issues may be the result of a trend of minor issues. More times than not, I mean, probably every time you have a major issue, you will conduct a root cause investigation. So a laboratory out of specification result would be an example of a major issue. And the impact to consumers is due to the fact that you will have a delay in product release. And finally, critical issues will for sure affect a quality attribute or critical process parameter. The impact to consumers is highly probable. You will always conduct a root cause investigation. And of course, uh, an example of a critical issue would be a product recall. You have adulterated product out in the field that um, definitely could impact product or consumer health and safety. So I talked, I touched on this a little earlier about, you know, your CAPA program needs to have um, requirements to look at data. Data tells a story. Um, you know, trending detect shifts in that data that may indicate a loss of effectiveness of process controls. And it also identifies, you know, that maybe further investigation is needed to, you know, to make some process improvements, or maybe there's additional training requirements that would be necessary. Trending and monitoring, um, you should, you can use statistical and non-statistical techniques. Uh, st statistical techniques would include you know, pie charts, Pareto charts, spreadsheets, and non-statistical techniques would be, you know, implementing um, CAPA review boards or quality review boards that meet, it's a cross-functional team that meets on some sort of frequency to look at the data and to make decisions on that data. You know, is the data telling, that, telling you that you need to maybe investigate through, a, through the CAPA program or through the CAPA process um, to, to, again, to be in that proactive state rather than reactive state. CAPA timeliness is always a hot button uh, with FDA regulators. Um, it's a critical element of CAPA execution. It's particularly important when you're dealing with 
issues that um, impact consumer health and safety. I didn't really get into it in this presentation, but each step of the CAPA process is really a phase. So you have your defined phase, your investigation phase, your action phase, and your, and your effectiveness phase. So your CAPA procedure should have requirements defined for each one of those phases. And it should also define the requirements if you need to escalate or say you need to um, extend a due date for one of those phases. That should all be defined in your, in your CAPA procedure. And again, establishing um, a cross-functional team such as the CAPA Review Board that gets together and discusses, you know, if there needs to be a shift in timeline, you know, and you have that documented, that justification documented through your meeting minutes through that CAPA Review Board. So CAPA documentation, just documentation for any other process that, that you have in your operation. All CAPA activities have has to be documented, whether you're a paper-based system or an electronic-based system. Um, all CAPA activities must be supported by objective evidence. You can't make decisions on, you know, what corrective actions you're going to implement without having some solid justification for that. You know, I would recommend that your CAPA, oh, oops, sorry, <laughs> um, your operations should, you know, establish CAPA metrics that, you know, again, that if cross-functional team can get together and, and look at and decide if, you know, action needs to be taken to put, you know, a situation into your CAPA program. And for anybody that's worked in a regulated industry has probably heard the statement, if it isn't documented, it, it didn't happen. <clears throat> that's awesome. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Um, Want to uh, throw another question out there before we transition over to Kevin? Um, actually, oh, uh, Keith, can you change? Actually, we can use this one. Yeah, so go ahead. Uh, first question, is a kappa required for a recall? Awesome, thank you everybody. Um, going through here, we'll close this out. So is a CAPA required for a recall? Um, this is a good knowledge check here, no judgment uh, with, uh, not everybody uh, answered the answered true. It is true, however, that a CAPA is definitely required for a recall. And um, if you've worked with the FDA, you've had a 43 warning letter, um, God forbid, you know that that's, you've gone through a recall. How do you navigate through the recall? Well, and show that you've, you know, where's your effectiveness? It's using the tools of CAPA to uh, get through your recall process. So the answer is definitely true. Um, uh, before I switch to Kevin, actually, there's a great question that was asked. Um, Kathleen, if you're, yeah, if you want to jump back in here and um, the, answer the question, the question is, is a CAPA different from HACCP or is it part of it or vice versa? Um, yeah, Kathleen, you want to speak to that? So HACCP is, is uh, essentially a risk assessment. So, and HACCP is conducted in the food industry. So it's definitely, um, I mean, if you are following uh, the food regulations, your, your organization will have a HACCP program in place. So I would say, you know, HACCP is definitely utilized in, in, the, in the CAPA process, but it's, they are independent processes. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, hopefully that helps answer your question. Um, if you want any more clarifications, um, you know, feel free to throw it in the chat or the Q&A, or we can, um, we can maybe um, expand on that a little bit later um, towards the end of the 
the, the webinar. Um, so that said, Kevin, I'm going to bring it back over to you and we can talk about the Colorado regulations. And I believe for folks that are here that are, that are uh, watching it live, there is, we'll put a link for you to the Colorado regulations so you can bookmark that and know exactly what we're talking about when the MED shows up on January 1 saying, are you meeting these regulations? Thanks, David. And uh, when you guys navigate to the link to um, the recall uh, regulations are going to be on page 124. And then uh, Kappa, I just have here is page 237. Um, you'll notice that throughout the code, Kappa uh, will be listed for, you know, manufacturing operations, cultivation, storefront, but uh, the language will be exactly the same when, uh, for the Kappa. Um, so yes, Colorado regulation. So um, I'm pretty deep in some of the um, policy changes that occur here in Colorado, um, especially with my involvement with the Colorado Cannabis Manufacturers Association. Um, I've had the pleasure of being on quite a bit of various rulemaking committees uh, with MED, CDPHE, Gov's office, other stakeholders, um, as well as being able to uh, uh, do quite a bit of policy changes within the state legislature here as well. And so, uh, I was involved on both uh, Kappa and uh, recall regulations here. So just to kind of give some background, uh, the Marijuana Science and Policy Work Group, uh, great committee of uh, various stakeholders, non-stakeholders, uh, you know, people that are much, much more uh, smart than I am. So uh, pretty incredible. People come together, talk about various issues. Uh, one of the subcommittees out of that group um, is the GMP subcommittee. Now it's called the QMS subcommittee. And the GMP subcommittee uh, last year was, was tasked uh, with creating some sort of uh, CAPA and recall standards here for, for Colorado. So uh, when we look at the CAPA background in particular, um, again, came from that GMP subcommittee. Um, the language itself was taken mostly from FDA, uh, FDA guidance documents. Um, specifically, uh, Elena Rodriguez from RM3 Labs um, drafted that original language and, and really did a wonderful job. And, and that was before um, ASTM finalized their uh, CAPA standards. When we look at recall in particular here, again, another one that came out of the QMS uh, or GMP subcommittee. And uh, what we did is we took that from um, various documents. Uh, so Title 21, Part 7, which is going to be FDA's recall policy. Um, another one was a document titled Methods for Conducting Recall Effectiveness Checks, which is another FDA document, which I think was first published in the 70s. Uh, then we have Regulatory uh, Procedures Manual, Chapter 7, which is more recall procedures from FDA. And then um, some, we took some elements from, from ASTM's uh, recall draft at the time. And so uh, the biggest takeaway here was making really recall requirements a little bit more applicable to the cannabis industry, especially um, communication to both MED, CDPHE, um, and then making sure that, uh, you know, that specific product information is also uh, listed in those uh, recall regulations. And then uh, what's pretty interesting to note here is originally the Recall regulations in particular were only required for manufacturers. Um, and what's interesting is this has finally expanded. So now cultivations have to have recall procedures, which makes sense because uh, historically in Colorado, that's where the most recalls are coming from. And what's great too is now storefront operations uh, have to have a recall plan as well. So we kind of cover that whole supply chain now here in Colorado, Colorado which is great. Now, when we look at the CAPA language here, um, it's gonna be pretty straightforward, to be honest here. Um, if we wanna go to the next slide, uh, we can kind of see the uh, meat and potatoes of it all here. So um, in your uh, CAPA plan, you basically need to um, put in there what constitutes a non-conformance in your business operations. Um, you know, you can make that whatever you want. I think in general, it's gonna be a deviation from your standard operating procedures. Um, you know, just start with that. Um, analyzing processes, work operations, reports, records, et cetera, um, right? Have, have there been any non-conformances from there, right? That's gonna be pretty important. 
investigating the root cause of the nonconformance. This is a, an extremely uh, critical element of a kappa. Um, and as I kind of discussed before, if you cannot find the root cause of the nonconformance, um, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to um, really close out that kappa or um, you know really develop a, a good kappa process. And just by the fact of not finding a root cause, right, will allow you to hopefully at least make some sort of uh, policy changes, procedural changes within your operations where you're now enabled to to do that. Uh, let's see here. Obviously, identifying the action needed to correct the uh, the uh, issue and prevent the reoccurrence. So generally, um, you'd find that root cause. You'd have maybe a short-term solution and a long-term solution. Uh, you just want to make sure that uh, you're implementing very thoughtful uh, solutions. And that's what's kind of nice about the kappa is that kind of forces you to think a little bit more critically about implementing a, a thoughtful solution versus without the kappa, uh, maybe a business might be quick to say, oh, it, it was just a one-off mistake or um, you know, something else that they kind of sweep under the rug. Um, let's see here, verifying the corrective action, preventative, ac preventative action to ensure such action is effective, right? So you're kind of doing effectiveness check. So uh, once you have um, implemented that short-term, long-term solution, um, occasionally you're gonna go back and see whether or not that issue occurred again. Um, if that issue hasn't occurred again, then hey, you, you really did a successful kappa. Um, if that solution or if that uh, issue occurred again, that means you didn't really think of a, a, a maybe as thoughtful solution as you could. So it gives you an opportunity to um, edit that solution and uh, make sure that is effective. Another thing here is uh, ensuring the information related to quality problems, nonconformances right, disseminated to those directly responsible to ensuring the quality of products. And so that's going to be important is making sure that you are relating pieces of information to the right people. Um, it shouldn't be just make one person that's doing the kappa, right? You really want to make sure you're integrating the right um, employees with those, uh, within those applicable parts of operations. And then last here um, is submitting relevant information, identifying quality problems, uh, of the corrective action, preventive action documentation, confirming the results of the evaluation for management for review. Again, you want to make sure that you're really uh, communicating uh, what's occurring here, what changes have been made. Um, again, not just to the employees in the trenches that are dealing with these issues, but also management as well. When we look at the recall language here, um, we can see that uh, effective, obviously, Jan 1 here of next year. Obviously, that's the same case for uh, Kappa as well. So uh, when we look at kind of the main elements here of the recall, and again, what we did is we, we mostly did a copy and paste job from FDA, um, is that uh, a manufacturing facility or, or now, right, a, a storefront or a uh, cultivation facility um, can make a voluntary uh, recall. Um, and so when we're looking at recalls, um, it might not necessarily even impact public health and safety. You know, maybe there is just a uh, small mistake on uh, a label, for example, right? Um, or maybe it might be a contamination issue. So either way, uh, best practice is absolutely going to be to um, call MED and CDPHE, um, especially if you're not sure whether or not maybe something constitutes a recall. Um, they're going to be an important source, especially CDPHE, um, to kind of help you along with that. Um, let's see, just kind of going down the row here. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to uh, identify, um, or I should say, first of all, we want to have the evaluation of the complaint or condition. So you might have a consumer or patient call in, maybe someone got sick of something or uh, off of something or, or some sort of ad adverse event reporting, right? As a business, uh, hopefully you're documenting all adverse events. Um, and so maybe you just have one um, or maybe if you have multiple, right? Um, that's definitely gonna be a huge red flag here. So, you know, with that, you want to identify um, basically the yeah, entity. Let's say if we're looking at a concentrate, for example, you wanna make sure you're able to identify um, that specific batch um, that experienced those adverse uh, effects from those patients or consumers. Um, on top of that, you want to make sure that you are notify, uh, notifying the affected parties. 
Um, and so that could be if you're a manufacturer, right? Going down the supply chain, right? Of course, metric helps with this stuff and ERP system is gonna help even better, but being able to identify um, those dispensaries or those other entities um, that, uh, that your product was essentially transferred to. And of course, right, at the same time, removal of the affected uh, product. So while you're communicating to the uh, dispensaries, for example, you wanna make sure that they are removing that product off their shelves, quarantining their product. If you have some uh, inventory still left, let's say at the manufacturing facility that you are doing exactly the same, quarantining that product um, and uh, making sure that's not getting transferred. Um, you know, best practice too on, on top of that is hopefully you're gonna be doing some additional testing on that product, right? And obviously if something comes up, if it's a, um, let's say a, a contaminant, maybe, maybe there's pesticides in there, right? Um, that's gonna be really valuable information. So being able to quarantine uh, in a good amount of time is um, gonna give you more valuable information, but of course it's gonna be better for public health and safety of your patients and consumers. Um, you know, kind of down the row a little bit too. Uh, additionally, you're gonna want to do uh, what's called effectiveness checks, um, and you want to basically ask yourself: Has all the product been accounted for? If you're very lucky and all the product is accounted for, um, then technically you wouldn't generally do an effectiveness check. Um, but generally, again, 100% of the product isn't always accounted for, and so basically what you're doing is you're contacting these uh, dispensaries or these folks. Uh, down the way in the supply chain and you're asking hey um you know how much product was was sold at your store how much were you able to quarantine right um how much x out of whatever was was essentially sold um and then again how much do you still have in your inventory and the goal is to account for as, as much of that product as you possibly can and that's really going to determine uh, whether or not you can finally close out your recall or you had to continue the recall um, in Colorado, um, to really close that recall, you're going to have to probably get permission from both uh, both MED and CDPHE. But being able to present that effectiveness check data um, is going to be really uh, critical in that determination. Any questions? Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Um, any folks have any questions related to that? Um, you got the link. Hopefully that worked and folks now know the pages so you can go and, you know, don't take our word for it. Read it for yourselves. They, you know, as the CRS outlines what's required of you as a business owner or, per, you know, a uh, compliance person operating on behalf of a business. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Kevin. <clears throat> um, we're going to transition this over to Greg um, with, um, and yeah, here, Keith, if you want to put that link in one more time, but yeah, we'll transition over to Greg. And while we do that, uh, we've got a quick question here for folks. Um, have you ever experienced a recall? And, you know, whether that was with your current company or with a company you're with or have been with, um, with a supplier that called you, as Kevin said, you're somewhere in the supply chain and said, hey, our product's got to be recalled and we sold that to you and you're using that in your ingredients. So, oh crap, what do we do now? Um, uh, I'm sure many folks have had close calls um, or, or maybe we're not sure. So yeah, go ahead folks. i will give you another about 20 seconds here to answer if you haven't already. We'll start closing that up here in about three seconds. So um, in terms of have you had experience with a recall, looks like the results are in. So fortunately, more than half of you um, have not yet had a uh, encounter with a recall. And, you know, there's uh, a lot of folks will say there's, there's kind of two types of companies. There's folks that have gone through a recall and the folks that will go through a recall. And uh, again, we're all humans, we make products, eventually something's going to happen. And the best you can do to mitigate that and be prepared and limit the extent of a recall, the better you'll be able to work through it. Um, and again, it may not be yourself, 
that was the the actual you know producer that required you know that made the mistake that resulted in the recall it could be a raw material ingredient supplier um, or somebody uh, further uh, up in the supply chain that you use their ingredients so it's really important to um, to be aware of that and to be prepared uh, when you least expect it uh, so with that said I've got Greg Jones here and uh, thanks Greg thanks Kevin I'll hand it over to you Greg to um, pick up all right, thank you, David. Um, first thing I'd like to start out talking about is um, the I part in the I kappa that it's integrated, right? So the way I wanna spend my next few minutes talking with you guys is how did we build out this program and call it an I kappa program? And then from there, because none of this ever happens in a vacuum, I wanna follow the path of how these things happen uh, within the industry and then of course within the regulations and some events that just happened recently that's gonna basically have a much bigger influence um, on the industry from a, regulata a regulatory standpoint. Well, for the first example, I wanna start with, <clears throat> um, MED comes out with a new regulation. It's new, it'll be law, right? January 1st. Uh, you must have a recall and a CAPA procedure. As you've heard through this whole uh, first, first part of this, first hour and a half, that can you have a kappa without a recall or a recall without a kappa? You know, it's, it's, it's part of your document uh, control program. How do you set up your hierarchy of your documents? What do you need and how do you need to do that? And for example, if you need to find the root cause of uh, what you need to correct, you probably need to do an investigation. Well, you wanna standardize that, so you put an investigation together. And that's the three basic SOPs that we put together uh, in this package. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of other QA ones, like how to handle a complaint, how do you do returns. Uh, I did, uh, I like seeing the last one on the supplier uh, recalls, two of them, two people that are attending this. And I don't know if that's just because of the interest or hopefully, God forbid, more uh, supplier issues uh, are becoming a problem. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, that we're going to tie in uh, the start to finish of the supply chain, the cultivation all the way to retail stores because in the past that's not been a, a big talking point within our own supply chain. And if we don't take control of it and, and help build it out properly from the industry point of view, then it's gonna be regulated to us and tell us how we're gonna do this stuff. Again, back to all the working committees that are happening within industry because my experience in about the last year and a half working within uh, the Colorado Science and Policy Group along with some of the other people that are attending here is that, um, we, we, we get to do it in a collaborative uh, and a consensus basis uh, for the most part. And as David said in the very beginning, it's gotta be integrated, it's gotta be collaborative, and it's gotta be consensus. So talking on how standards are being made and put into place, instead of what are we up to, uh, 1933, how many states that have their own set of regulations just state to state, well, we're all trying to drive toward FDA regulations. So what drives that? Well, there's uh, different third-party organizations, ASTM for one, USP for another one. Uh, even, even on a local level, CDPHE uh, has standards that, that uh, we'll be looking at as, as a uh, in-state committee of what makes the most difference. And then recently, like within the last week, it was announced uh, organization, uh, CANRA, which is a group of uh, about 19 different state regulatory uh, bodies, whether it's uh, uh, cannabis related or whether it's even uh, through uh, their health departments. And uh, it's more of a regulatory, uh, they're not pro or anti uh, cannabis or C uh, CBD hemp. They're in business to help advise other states as they come online and share uh, the, um, the, the challenges, the victories, and uh, whatever else needs to happen. So they're an advisory board. So what we talked about in our group uh, recently, our subcommittee group, was that basically we're now working uh, for and with 19 other states that are putting uh, uh, new standards in process. Well, again, back to ASTM, for instance, even though it's an international organization, uh, it's open to anybody that wants to join uh, at the very least, you can uh, review and challenge any standards that are come through, coming through. It's a peer review process. They won't pass something if they don't get enough uh, activity on it. So 
even though you're just one person, you can, you can author and uh, write a standard for submission for review and when it becomes one. And then uh, you can see where I'm going with all this as far as integrating the same standards that are basically used throughout in different industries, certainly pharmaceutical, dietary supplements. A lot of this stuff is based on something that already exists. So why not just take the best of it or just adopt the standard, whichever one makes the most sense and put it in there. And here we are. So to, uh, to wrap up, I guess, to slow down a little bit, um, if you just look at, at, at how some of this stuff came about today, uh, this program is that, like Kevin said, we worked with them uh, to do an implementation here, but it was certainly much bigger than just the collective uh, uh, putting in a small system, the iKappa, but you can see where it threads and integrates into everything else within, within their organization. Then instead of preventing that from becoming overwhelming by just doing this on paper or through spreadsheets, is highly recommend getting some type of a manage uh, or a document management system for review, for training, for updates, for all kinds of good stuff. So there's lots of opportunity to integrate that into your system as well. I know that's, that's one of the challenges industry has, and I'm sure anybody in industry would agree with that, is we don't want to overwhelm, ourse overwhelm ourselves with how we do stuff, but at the same time, if we don't document it, again, it didn't happen. So there's, there's lots of opportunities, there's lots of resources, there's just lots of great collaboration uh, going on, uh, crossing over regulatory, um, industry, um, third-party standards. So if anybody has any questions uh, outside of just this program and stuff, hopefully you'll have some great resources to reach out to and anything we can do to help you with. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, David, we can move into the next section. Awesome. Thanks so much, Greg. Yeah, anybody, uh, you know, a lot of good information there. Um, you know, as Greg pointed out, ASTM International, if folks want to Google that aren't aware of it, ASTM D37, that should bring you straight to the website. That's an international standards organization that is 120 years old. Um, quick fun fun fact before I segue to understand where, you know, where standardization, why, you know, cap and recall and all this good happy stuff comes into play. Um, for example, turn of the century, uh, railroads were being built across, across our um, our great country. Um, and I have to remember that it's 2020. So when I say turn of the century, I'm not referring to 20 years ago, I'm referring to 120 years ago. And uh, when, when railroad, uh, when steel was, you know, laid, they realized that, well, when we buy the steel from, from Britain, you know, the rail, the uh, rail cars seem to be just fine. When uh, we, we grab that steel that we've created here in say Pittsburgh or somewhere in Pennsylvania, um, the the trains are actually falling over. This is this is like not just made up. This is really what happened around the turn of the century in 1900s. And well, why is that? <clears throat> well, because some they've treated the steel differently. It's not all steel is steel. You know, there's different grades and classes of steel and production methods that go into harden that steel, right? Um, so so literally, AS team was born out of that around the turn of uh, I think it was 1896 is when. Um, American uh, standardization for testing and materials was created and now here we are in 2020, four years old, um, is the ASTM D37 Cannabis Standards Committee. So helping drive consensus adoption for standards across the world um, for cannabis. And, um, you know, as a business owner, you want to be able to, uh, you know, grow your company in a sustainable fashion and you know be able to compare apples to apples while your your product is better safer etc um without standardization you you don't have that right so there, there's a lot of value there and i urge folks to get involved um be involved and that's something we can all certainly um you know share with you guys more information on um so again <clears throat> why are we here right <clears throat> um you know, recalls is kind of the worst case scenario Right, and uh, we've certainly seen lots of that um, here in Colorado, across America, across the, the world, right? And um, you know, of course, there was the the study that came out through uh, D Denver Department of Public Health a little over a year ago now, uh, with about 25 dispensaries uh, being tested for product mold, and 80% failed. 
that 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 should be a little scary because back to testing well uh, the testing results were already scary enough in my eyes at 12% failure rate final product testing but somehow there was 68% of products that passed and uh, somehow failed later. So again, is your is your process effective? Does it ensure safety beyond product testing? Have you built quality into it before product testing? Those are all critical components that, again, as a business owner or as a compliance person, you don't wanna have to fight any more fires than you have to. Uh, you don't wanna be surprised that your product failed because you didn't have process in place. And so, you know, here's just as we've kind of gone through time, right? There's recalls left and right, you know, in later, uh, you know, August, there was a, you know, recent one, I believe there's been two since then. Um, it's a painful, it's a painful experience that nobody ever wants to have to deal with. And, you know, of course, in Michigan, we had this, um, uh, you know, while, while this was a one off, um, who licked my pre roll? Um, it, it just takes this to get into the news, to the national news that hurts us as an industry, right? Um, whether it was super isolated and that's not representative of the industry, the consumer doesn't realize that. The consumer sees this item, right? And that makes them be hesitant to buy product from the trusted dispensaries, from the trusted brands, because they don't have trust in that. And I can go to the black market or the illicit market and, and you know, my guy, my person can, I can buy it from them. And without, you know, the more these things happen, the, the harder it's going to be for us to, you know, burn through that stigmatization. Um, so having a cap of process in place to be able to detect these things and prevent them from happening and controlling it is critical. Um, so, um, actually, I'm going to skip this poll break. I don't, I think we actually already did the uh, poll, um, which is, you know, is a cap required for recall and have folks gone through a recall. Um, you know, for the folks that have gone through a recall, you can probably speak to uh, the painful experience. Um, maybe it gives you a little bit of shivers, chills, or um, maybe there's some PTSD there. So, you know, I, I apologize for folks that have gone through that. I, I know how traumatic it is. it can be. And, um, you know, let that serve as a lesson um, that, that no other person should have to go through that. Um, let's, let's reduce the severity of that. Because reality is, you know, the cost of a recall is far beyond the financial losses of the product that has to be destroyed. <clears throat> you know, that gets into the news. And again, it's not even your brand. It's, it's, it's the, you know, if you're Nabisco or you're General Mills, um, you know, and your competitor has a recall, um, for example, when, when there's been outbreaks in say the lettuce, um, you know, leafy greens, when there's a recall, all leafy greens, forget romaine lettuce is the culprit, all leafy greens were affected by up to 20%. So the entire market contracted. Same thing happened in cannabis, right, with vape pens. When the, you know, was it vitamin E? Was it, you know, what was it? Was it the illicit market? Was it the non-illicit market? Doesn't matter, vape pen sales, plummeted when that happened. So it, it behooves us all um, to look beyond our kind of internal, you know, businesses to realize that this affects all of us. Um, so the cost of recall is huge. Um, and of course, the worst case scenario is consumer health. Um, I, I don't have the, uh, there is a product, I think in 2018, Aspergillus was detected in um, some, you know, legal product in the state of California. And this lady actually, who was a healthy individual, um, actually ended up in the hospital um, paralyzed um, because of Aspergillus contamination in their, in the, in the uh, cannabis uh, shake that she was buying. And again, like I said, the industry reputation legit, legitimacy. So, you know, as a compliance person, it, again, it's, you're in the day to day, your, your paperwork's not filled out the batch, you know, I'm missing this manifest, it's my C of A right. Um, this is the worst case, your reputation legitimacy, you don't wanna have to be dealing with a recall. You wanna have your ducks in a row. So use this to get ahead of the curve. Um, and, you know, just to, to tie to, try to tie it back to the bottom line, right? Um, you know, there, there's so many components that you can use to tie it back to why financially this is going to help you as a business and why you must look at this. So let's look at cannabis cultivators, right? <clears throat> and, um, you know, there's a packaging study done by um, Bovida, um, who is a great two-way moisture um, pack, which I wish I had one handy. I would I would hold it up. It's, you know, anybody that has cannabis around, um, 
you know, should, should be using that to control our moisture, but um, you know, the weight, so specifications, right? And this really comes back to being able to measure um, and manage your entire operation. So what do you determine is pass fail? Is it, is it as simple as, well, the pesticides came back non-detect and here's what the THC percentage is and now I'll slap it on my label and ship it and the mycotoxins passed. Um, are you looking at water activity? Are you looking at moisture content? Are you looking at the quality and integrity and structure of the bud? Do any of those things matter to you? Or are you just schlepping cannabis out the door? Because, um, <laughs> Because if the reality is, you know, you're just um, you're just slapping cannabis out the door. Well, how are you differentiating yourselves? Why would I buy you over another person? And uh, at what point do you say, well, my quality's kind of degraded, right? Um, whether it's the steel or otherwise or cannabis. At what point do you differentiate your product quality? So, you know, relative to, for example, uh, an eighth, you know, three and a half grams. Well, is the package 3.5000 grams? Is it between 3.4 and 3.6? Are you overpacking? Are you underpacking? Uh, is it is it a sealed container? These are all things you have to think about that can lead to, um, you know, an, an issue with product quality that ultimately affects bottom line. And in worst case scenarios where um, where your package is too moist, product is too moist, <clears throat> you can grow mold and uh, surprise the, you know, you maybe you weren't part of the 12% of product that failed the initial or the final product test, but now all of a sudden you're part of the 80% that failed test when purchased at the dispensary. Um, so you want to look at these things um, and and control your quality. Um, this is part of this study that um, Bovida and another group commissioned where um, looking at the water activity, so the moisture content and looking at the fact that it's kind of all over the place. Um, you know, they did this study across seven different markets, eight different markets um, throughout the West. And the reality was that the product quality was all over the place. And, you know, from 42% humidity or moisture where it's really, really dry and crispy to, you know, say 60% moisture, um, you know, water activity, that, that's a big difference. And at what point um, does that affect your bottom line? Does that impact your consumer preference and whether they're gonna repeat buy from you or not? Um, you know, so kind of following that example, let's just look at this from a pure number standpoint for the case study of cannabis flower. <clears throat> if you have, if you figure $5 price per gram and you imagine a thousand pounds per year, if you're drying the crap out of your cannabis because you don't want to have that microbial, you know, yeast and mold failure. So you're just dry it. Well, all right, let's take it to 45%. At $5 price per gram, 1,000 pounds per year, you're looking at about two and a quarter million dollars of revenue. And the weight is really about 994 pounds. And you know, here's some you know, organoleptic and uh, consumer tests that looking at the potency, flavor, smoke, and color, that's what you get. Bring it up to 50%. Well, now we're at 1,000 pounds of weight and our numbers have increased by, you know, a decent fifteen thousand dollars. That's you know that's that's part that's a part time position right there, um, and you know the product quality actually changes. And you know you can actually look at these are these are um, high resolution my um, images there for folks that are looking at the blow up of the trichomes, and look at how the glandular trichomes actually change quality. And what does that mean for potency? What does that mean for flavor? The terpenoids, you know, the other minor cannab compounds that make the consumer actually want to buy your product um, and repeat buy. And well, again, 0.65 back to an ASTM international standard that is also um, adopted into the Colorado revised statutes between 55 and 65% is, is ideal. Anything above 0.65 is actually unsafe. If you bring it up close with a, you know, with a buffer and bring it up to 62%, well, now we're talking almost $100,000 more in revenue all because you didn't over dry your product. And oh wait, so there's a financial benefit you're saying? There is a quality perspective. I mean, look at the glandular trichomes there in that blown up image. Look at, you know, you're not losing potency. You're not having, you know, uh, the cannabinoids degrade. You're not volatilizing off your terpenes and you've got better smoke and color and huh, 14 more pounds uh, just because you increased your moisture content from 55% to 62%. Such a small difference in terms of controlling your drying and you have more product to sell. 14 pounds, what could you do with 14 more pounds? Well, you could make another $60,000 or so. Not too bad. 
Um, so again, looking at the difference in the quality of these glandular trichomes makes a difference. And, you know, while your average consumer may not be jumping in and looking under a, you know, a 10x or 40x microscope and lens, um, th this is the perception in the real sommelier and the connoisseur. And again, it comes back to dollars and cents. You're going to get more money out of it. So it helps you in so many ways. Um, and, you know, to just expand on water activity and talking about, um, you know, somebody mentioned HACCP a little bit earlier. And, you know, we talked a bit about, you know, how HACCP and CAPA are related, but not, um, you know, HACCP is a tool for identifying your risks and controlling them through, through critical control points. If folks aren't aware of HACCP, um, it's something we can certainly help you with too. We've got a HACCP service that we can offer folks or, or even a higher level, more general and broad risk management program. Um, but really looking at water activity, right? And this comes out of the food industry. Um, at what point do you start getting, um, you know, oxidation? Do you start getting browning reactions? Do you get mold growth, yeast and bacteria? Well, depending on your moisture activity, um, plenty of studies have been done and there is a determination at which it's safe versus not safe. So this is probably the most science heavy slide you'll see. Take a look at it later. Um, don't, don't get caught up in, in graphs and bar curves um, or you'll need another cup of coffee if you're not a statistician or a math, math nerd. Um, so again, what do you want your product to look like? Um, is this, is this acceptable? You know, when this comes out of Denver's, uh, dispensaries because the product was not controlled or, you know, handled in a controlled manner. Um, should you even be using aluminum foil, right? I mean, how are you packaging it? Is this professional? Um, I like to, I like to think back to, you know, use the analogy that there is a difference between Thanksgiving's coming up and of course, Thanksgiving in 2020 is not going to look like a Thanksgiving in, in the rest of the, in any other year for most folks. Um, and, you know, it's one thing to produce, um, to bring the brownies and the dessert for your family. And, you know, this year it might be a very small family um, versus scaling it up and producing for, you know, a congregation of 300 people or, you know, an industry and consumers that are thousands of people. Um, <clears throat> whether you're using a commercial kitchen or the uh, oven you bought at Lowe's, whether you're, um, you know, it's one thing to be baking. Most folks probably don't use hair nets and gloves at home, but um, now you're creating product for thousands of people. Better have that hair net on. You don't want hair net hair falling into your large vat of chocolate chips and flour. Um, and oh, are you measuring it out? Is it you know I uh, got about two cups plus or minus, or is this actually prescribed and weighed out in a precise manner? And what are your tolerances? And how are you managing that? So all this ties into a CAPA program for continuous improvement. Um, so, you know, that said, I kind of, you know, we're getting actually towards the end here, um, barring any major questions, but uh, let's tie it back to what Greg had mentioned earlier. And, you know, Kappa and Recall is really an integrated solution, right? Um, so one thing that we can offer folks, and whether you Google them, get them online, you need to know how to use these tools. Because again, these tools are not just for checkbox and compliance, it's actually to help you as a business owner. Um, so, you know, when you look for the SOPs and you measure their effectiveness, do you have SOPs for Kappa? Do you have SOPs for deviations? And how do you manage your recalls? And do you have the supporting records for this? And again, there's multiple ways to, you know, approach this. Um, every operation operates a little bit differently. That's the cool thing about these regulations as they evolve. It's not super prescriptive. It's more of a guideline <clears throat> and you must do these certain things or meet these things, but how you meet them is up to you as a business. Um, you get to evaluate your own risks. You know, uh, Kathleen talked about minor, major and critical. It's, it's not an easy black or white um, kind of determination there. You need to sit down and look at it from, you know, the voice of the customer. What's the risk of the consumer? What's our business risk? What's our, you know, how much, uh, what kind of operational controls do we have? Um, so you need to tailor it to your specific operation. And again, you know, Kevin mentioned this earlier, training of senior management staff um, without senior management understanding the value of this, um, because again, you're in business to, to have a successful business. Um, it behooves everybody in senior management leadership to really buy in and know that this program is the tool um, not only does it help you help the compliance folks show the auditors that they're compliant, but it is the tool for your specific operation to reduce risk. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, part of that, right, and this is what we do with our clients, um, you know, Kevin was our, our fantastic at Apothecary, our first case study, um, run a mock recall. 
Um, I can tell you a story when I worked with a company that went um, in, in Canada about two years ago, just because of the uh, beauty of the seed to sailor track and trace systems that we all loathe. Um, and uh, they, they were 90 kilograms off with their product when they did a mass balance calculation. Took them, um, the police department showing up, took them Health Canada showing up. It was not a fun story. <clears throat> and, uh, and about three months later, it was time to do a mock recall. And I can tell you right now, the COO was, we got AirMed, we've got our seed to sale system. This is, why do we even have to do this? Four hours later, about 50% of the product had been um, in this exam hypothetical recall that we ran. I literally had the compliance and quality team looking at me exhausted, asking if we could stop. They were ready to give up. And I said, well, are you ready for your COO to get the report that shows that you've accounted for about 50% of your product? And um, it was an eye opener. So if you don't run a mock recall, you have no idea whether this SOP that you have in place works. And the last thing you want, you know, it's like being in elementary school or in school where you have a fire drill every year because when last worst case scenario, a fire happens, this should be not, what do we do? Scream fire, who's going where? This should be a process in place and people need to know their roles and responsibilities. You need to know where to get that information <clears throat> because ultimately that ties back to the effectiveness report, right? and ensuring that your program is effective. This is to work for you guys. It's to keep the industry safe. It's to keep our reputation there. <laughs> um, and again, so folks that wanna you know, learn more, please you know, reach out to us at ICAPA at gmp-c.com or gmpcollective.com um, because really this is so important. And is, again, it's compliant, it's required, January 1. <clears throat> um, we, I see another question come in here. Um, so yeah, you know, is there a general CAPA program in written form we can purchase for our company as a starting point? Um, two things related to that. Um, the answer is obviously yes. Um, there's two ways to do that. Again, it, you know, we can help you do it. Um, what we provide is not just the templates because if you want to do a template and you want to do it on your own, Google it literally um, for probably $50 or less, you can find a CAPA SOP and a recall SOP. Um, that follows kind of pharma standards. And if you have the technical uh, ability, time and know how to implement that in your in your system, in your company, and you just need a starting point, you can do that really cheap, really easy. Um, but will it be effective um, kind of comes back to do you have the capacity to manage that and train your team and actually use it? Uh, if the answer is no, call us, we've got a solution for you, <clears throat> um, which includes the training of the senior management and staff, walking through that first mock recall with you and you know seeing what an effectiveness report looks like so you guys can identify your weaknesses and improve on them. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question there. And you know as we kind of think about you know what are the takeaways and how do you use this? You know before you even think about a CAPA program, look back internally, reflect on your operation um, and ask these questions. You know how well do you understand your operation? And by that, you know I mean do you know what your weekly uh, throughput is? Do you know um, the last time your piece of equipment was calibrated? Um, how, what's the theoretical or optimal yield of an extraction process? You know, how do you know who does what on what day? Does first shift and second shift do the same thing? Do they, how do you know that they do the same thing? Um, how well do you understand your operation? And specifications, you know, this all comes back to specifications. The, the, the fun part is we, we're dealing with a botanical product, right? So, uh, you know, I have a lot of folks when we first work with clients, they're like, well, this is, a, this is a natural product. It grows wild. Like, how can I control it? And, you know, the first thing I kind of push back with is, why did you spend millions of dollars to, control, to build an indoor facility? If it's just that easy, just let it grow outdoors and why are you even worried about it? If you've <clears throat> installed an HVAC system for a reason, you've put certain lights, you, you've toiled over the kind of lights you're going to use and the kind of nutrients you're going to use, that's an, if, an attempt to control and optimize your product quality, right? So you need specifications to define what's good, what's not so good, and then what's going to stop us in our tracks and not release that product before the MED says, oh, your product's unsafe and there's a recall, or your testing lab says your results failed. Um, you know, and, and really thinking about it, <clears throat> back to the, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Um, are you documenting your challenges? I like to call them challenges in a way that allows you to demonstrate improvement. So 
just because you're within this range, X and Y, um, can you improve? Is that acceptable? Do you want to get better? Um, is it a profitable uh, range that you're operating in? How do you how do you demonstrate improvement? <clears throat> because all of these are tied together. Um, and and really, you know, back to the part of you know your staff. Do they have the right tools? Do they have the effectiveness um, form? Do they have a deviation or not a spec form? Do they know how to use it? Have they been trained on it? Um, because you know, quality starts on the production floor and it, it behooves every every business owner to um, kind of empower and employ their, their production line, their front staff, frontline workers to get it right the first time and have the tools to be set up for success so the compliance can work with them to make sure that they are maintaining compliance. <laughs> and that when things go wrong, because again, we're all humans and this is, you know, living, breathing organism, there's so many variables, um, that you have the tools to, um, to go through a corrective action process and in root cause investigation um, to ensure that these things are met while being compliant. <laughs> um, so with that said, I wanna take it to one more poll break and then we will um, we will start to wrap up here. So I'll pause here. Um, actually, is that true, Keith? I think we're going to save that for the the exit um, the exit poll. Um, so we'll actually move forward here and wrap up. Um, you know, really to kind of tie this in. So, if folks, have any final questions? Please um, please raise your hand. Um, throw it in the q and I hope we've uh, done a good job at answering most folks' questions. Really appreciate everybody's time. Um, the beauty is, you know, there are solutions at your disposal. Um, there's us at the GMP Collective, and then of course there's there's these partners. You know, it starts and ends with supply chain. Um, you need to manage your supply chain because, you know, as, as there were several folks that answered earlier in one of the polls, it wasn't them that had to deal with the recall, but it was their supplier that they had to manage a recall uh, because of. So, you know, managing your supply chain, being able to predict how your outputs and your inputs and not having to scramble to, you know, rush order materials and ingredients, you know, that, that allows you to actually get ahead of the curve and not be in firefighting mode and um, not be blindsided by mistakes because you're having to rush. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's something that, you know, Supply Chain OpEx Consulting really helps with and we work really close with them on, on many projects. Um, BSI is, you know, globally recognized, um, over 100 years old. <laughs> they provide, um, you know, world-class services and quality management, risk assessments, et cetera. I'm really happy to have them around. Um, you know, and it all ties back to numbers, right? So pulling, merging in with Akeen Consulting, for example, to understand your, your tax uh, and Occasions I even just learned to the client the other day that um, there's there's ways to look at this from a research and development perspective and get state tax credits based on the continuous improvement working you're doing. So use Kappa as a tool to actually um, take business deductions that <laughs> you could not have taken before because of 280E. Um, there's ways to get a little bit more creative there and um, applying it. So uh, Akeen's a great group for that. And then of course tying it all together as Kevin mentioned, um, you know I love compliance. Um, they, they use um, Power DMS, which um, if I recall, the MED actually uses Power DMS. The state of Colorado, um, the Denver Crime Lab, uh, the Colorado State Police, um, hospitals, they use the software that I Love Compliance utilizes to help our clients maintain um, compliance from you know training records, SOPs, document control, all these things that can be a real pain in the butt to do by by paper, especially in a COVID world where if your employees don't have to be in every day, you don't want them in every day. Um, how do you have an electronic system? So I love compliance works with retailers, um, dispensaries, uh, all over the all over the country. <clears throat> um, they're with several multi-state operators, and it's a great tool that um, that Tim's group at I Love Compliance offers. So there's great solutions at, at your disposal. Um, and um, so yeah, we're we're gonna get to wrap up a little bit early, so folks can maybe get out 15 minutes early before um, before you know you kind of move on <clears throat> with your day. But I really appreciate your time, folks. Um, there will be an exit survey. Um, so please, you know, at, um, answer that exit survey. One of the questions is, do you want, do you want help? Um, do you want us to reach out to you? Um, you know, we can, we can follow up with you directly um, short of you uh, emailing us. So I just want to thank everybody that, that attended. I want to thank um, our 
our panelists, myself, Kathleen, really appreciate your time and expertise. It's been great working with you. Um, thank you for bringing your 25 plus years of you know medical life science expertise in the Kappa world to the cannabis industry. We need more folks to transcend that. Um, Greg, thank you so much for being uh, you know <clears throat> our right hand man, making sure that operations works and um, providing clients with value in these solutions. And uh, Kevin, thanks for being part of this uh, you know, pilot program and being able to demonstrate a success story of uh, what, you know, how Kappa and uh, Mock Recall program can work for you. Um, so I'm not seeing any, um, any questions but um, feel free to jump them. We'll, we'll hang on the line here. I was going to have a fun outro video, but unfortunately uh, my, I'm having some technical difficulties on my computer. So um, stand by for some more follow-up information and I uh, really appreciate your time, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.